right, well, hello, my name's Kate Lawler. And first things first, on behalf of the APA and in the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who may watch this e-talk. So welcome to this APA e-talk called Dementia, every physiotherapist's business. As I said, my name's Kate. I'm a physiotherapist, I'm a member of the APA and I'm part of the Gerontology Committee. I'm joining you today from the Wicking Dementia Research and Education Centre in Hobart. But despite my background in gerontology, this interview will be relevant to hopefully pretty much all physios. Dementia is a condition impacting almost half a million Australians, of whom about 30,000 people almost have younger onset dementia. Almost all people with dementia live in the community, not in nursing homes. And all people with dementia have bodies and physios are good at helping with bodies. So I'm very pleased to present this video to you today with our guest, Phil Hazel. As physiotherapists, we talk to people a lot. Uh, we ask lots of questions, but usually there's a goal in mind pretty much we're wanting to bring someone from what's your problem and how can I help? We very rarely get the opportunity to actually sit and listen and reflect to the reflections of somebody who actually might be on the other end of our physiotherapy treatment or, you know, living with a particular condition. So today is one of those rare opportunities and I'm very pleased to interview uh, Phil Hazel. And Phil, I'd love to uh, welcome you. Thank you for your time today. And do you want to start by actually um, introducing yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Phil Hazel. Um, I was diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's, younger onset dementia at 55. Um, I started to feel the effects, I guess, at about 53. But my main role now, having uh, retired from work, is advocacy uh, in this area to um, uh, medical practitioners and um, uh, all sorts of different uh, professions to try and get a better deal for uh, patients when they get their diagnosis. So, Phil, are you comfortable to tell us a little bit about that whole diagnosis side of things? What happened? You're very young. A lot of people think you have to be really old to get dementia, but you weren't. Yeah. Um, my wife first noticed that um, I wasn't sort of just keeping up well with um, communication. Um, I was putting things in weird places around the house. Um, I couldn't sort of sequence things very well but it wasn't on a consistent basis. Um, I couldn't follow instructions like putting a, um, a hose reel together that I got from Bunnings. So I had to take it back there and they put it together in, in three minutes. So job done. But that was just another thing that came up that got us worried what was going on. So um, after about three months' work, we got a diagnosis and... Um, that didn't go at all well uh, in terms of how we were told and treated. Um, and that's a, one part I, I, I'm advocating to change, uh, to be told that, you've, um, uh, that you should get your affairs in order and, and that's it, no referral to Dementia Australia or follow-up information uh, made it pretty tough from the start. But... Because I retired, I reinvented myself as an advocate and then chair of the Dementia Australia Advisory Committee and doing media and all sorts of things, speaking. So it's given me back my, um, here we go, Kate, with words. Um, it's given me back my um, self-worth. Uh, there's another word I'm thinking, I can't remember it. Um, yeah, self-worth, I think, probably works. And um, so that was a reinvention. And then I reinvented myself again after finishing as the chair of the, of the committee, and that was via uh, Twitter. So a lot of my advocacy is done there and also uh, various speeches around Australia. 
And I guess the big thing that shows me out is my assistant's dog, Sarah. Yes. So uh, <laughs> she travels everywhere with me. She flies on the plane with me and, and she keeps me, well, she knows if I'm getting confused or lost and she stops and makes me stop and we have a cuddle for a while. And once we feel a bit more confident, we get on the way. And um, when I'm in hotel, she finds my keys and my wallet and my phone and all those sorts of things that you need to, to get out of the front door. So she makes the whole thing a, a heck of a lot easier. So um, I guess I, I am a person that's living well with dementia. It's just that things take me a lot more time. So, so, Phil, you say you're living well with dementia. I've heard lots of people say things like they'll talk about dementia sufferers or, you know, victims or things like that. Does that sort of thing bother you or do you just kind of, I don't know, I think Dementia Australia has got some words around what they prefer. I hate the word suffering from dementia. I, I just prefer the word living with dementia or in my case and all my dementia mates <coughs> excuse me all my <coughs> dementia mates all live well with dementia um because we often see each other through um advocacy uh we're often at, at, at sort of different stages um but you don't lose your intellect because you're diagnosed with um dementia there's it's not a mental health uh, issue it's a it's a brain disease um, but if you keep your mind super active and do a lot of things I think it it makes it um, it makes it more um, consistent or even you can increase your function when you put a lot of work into it which I think I have but it's going to drop down at some stage but it's a case of you know making it last as long as as possible I guess yeah so I'm guessing that there'd be people that would meet you around about the place or could be even a health professional and they wouldn't necessarily know that you have dementia no they won't um and unless in some conversations I um depending on how I feel I can really battle to try and find the right words like we've spoken before and and sometimes I'm I'm searching for that right word and I have to try and describe it and have someone help me come up with that word. Um, Kate, I can't remember the question now. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. I've got a bunch of questions actually, and yep. I would love to take you back to um, the diagnosis side of things. Yep. Um, so you mentioned it took three months of work to, um, to get a diagnosis. What, what did that look like? Like, what, what do you mean by three months of work? Oh, I had to do a whole lot of tests. And um, like they were, the best way I can describe it would be a bit like those psych tests you do when you do a job application or what you're used to. Um, but you had to draw drawings and um, uh, remember things. Um, honestly, I can't remember most of it. Mm. Um, was it your GP, Phil? Did you go to No, your... no, this was with a neurologist. Okay, so, okay. So we told the GP that something wasn't right. She referred us to the neuro. Yep. And in conjunction with um, psychologists, we did all the, the paperwork, terms of tests and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And question answers. And then that information went to the, I guess, to the neurologist. And we sat down and he said, um, you should go and get your affairs in order and um, yeah so, so tell me more about that what is what so can you can you I don't know how that would feel but can you tell us about that moment when you're sitting there being told um, stuff I think both of us were confused uh we were both frightened uh we both bawled our eyes out because there was no um there was no path given to us to follow, I guess is the best way to put it. So, you know, after a couple of weeks, I, I um, Googled dementia and came up with Dementia Australia. 
then um, we went in for an interview, both of us, where we, I guess, spent half of it crying, trying to come to terms with what was going on. Um, but we got 95% of our support from Dementia Australia. So, you know, all the information, groups that we could join, and no, you don't play bloody carpet bowls. Um, you know, I'd like to sit through a lecture of the, um, the new James Webb Space Telescope and go and play bowls. So it's not, it's not the same for younger onset dementia. Um, uh, I guess that's an extreme, but, but I'm trying to put that point across. Um, can you get over that question again, Kate? I, I'm yeah, just so forgetting things as I go along. No, you're doing great. And so this whole business of, um, you mentioned about being told to just get your affairs in order. What, what, what did they actually say? Do you remember? Um, what did he say? Yeah. Um, he said, uh, you have Alzheimer's. And um, uh, I remember going back between his nose and his nose. And I sort of lost the order. I had to keep doing it for as long as long. And he just sat down with me and said, um, you most likely have Alzheimer's. I don't think they could really tell until you die and they do a uh, autopsy, I guess. Um, and then he said, go and get your affairs in order. I mean, go and get your, your affairs in order is a, is a very good idea. You don't, like that's about the fourth or fifth thing you might say down the line. Um, there was no, yeah, no path. There was no information. We had to go and find all that. And once we did, it, it made our, it made the job for Jan and I a lot easier. So knowing what you know now, what do you wish had happened? What do you think should happen when someone receives a diagnosis of dementia? Um, I think, I think practices need more complementary, uh, when I say practices, neurology needs more ancillary staff or paralegal staff, but, you know, professionals such as uh, psychologists and uh, an occupational therapist that they can access through that particular clinic. It might be I don't know, six neurologists out of the same office. Well, out of those six, they're seeing quite a few patients. And I think they have to have the other professions for Jan and me to go straight into to at least find more um, information. Yeah. It doesn't matter we have to go to that. It doesn't mean we have to go to that occupational therapist or physiotherapist or whoever it may be, but at least tell us what, an occupational therapist can do so we know how it fits in where does a physiotherapist come into it um yeah just just more information and and somewhere to go instantly and then get referred on to the you know the right people mm. yeah so what did you do then how did you find because I, I gather you uh connected in with the ndis how did that kind of come to pass? Um, Dementia Australia had staff out in the field that, uh, uh, that looked after a group with younger onset dementia and they put you in touch with the NDIS and, and I think they helped manage that plan, but it's gone out to a third party now. But, but I have a plan manager, um, that helps put that year together. Um, I worked with a physiotherapist. I worked with an occupational therapist and my psychiatrist is the one that manages my dementia because her father has been through it and she understands it very well. And uh, she also helps me with my anxiety and depression, uh, which I have no um, effects from um, it's super well controlled and of course that's important with uh, with dementia as well yeah okay so you said 
you've seen a few different health professionals. You have yep. seen physios and we yep. are talking to physios today. Can you okay. tell us a bit about your experience with physio? Um, yeah. Um, it began um, with, with dementia. It's sometimes you don't see this. If I'm going down steps, you don't know where the next step is. You get confused, which is the next one. Um, so sometimes you have to hold the railing like sideways and, and go down sideways a bit step by step. So you, you've got two hands to hold on to. Um, and of course, doing that, then swinging your body round, stuff my, my knees up, or particularly my right one. Um, so that was causing a lot of pain. Pain then affects your dementia. And that's, that's a well known link. Um, so unless I could get that pain under control, then it's going to bring my, when I say, it's going to lower my function mm -hmm. by the dementia gets worse through that particular period. So it's, and of course, out of that was my balance was cactus. So, um, and, and that's all interwound with the, um, the steps. Um, so I did a lot of balance training uh, on this. Well, it's like a flat balloon or something. It's quite soft yeah. and you, you stand on that and you do a lot of double feet and single feet and all sorts of stuff. That, that did make a big help and gave me more confidence. The knee treatment um, stopped the pain. And because of the balance, I was able to go down the stairs slowly, but in a normal fashion. And of course I have my assistance dog. So she's immediately down on my left and she doesn't go forward of me. She stops at each step until she sees my leg go down. Then she comes forward. So she's not pulling on me or putting mm. any um, stress on me. So then that all turns into whether I'm independent or not. So it starts from my, started from my dementia, then my uh, not knowing where the next step was. That doesn't happen all the time, but enough. Then walking down the steps in an unusual way to keep my balance. Then with the physio, I was able to uh, walk down normally. The pain was were actually gone in the end um, and that made my dementia um, much better so it's all it's all sort of um, it all interacts and I don't think a lot of particularly on, in physiotherapy I don't think enough uh, of your colleagues understand how dementia um can be helped through that, through your profession? I have to say, <clears throat> so I'm at the moment working at the Wicking Centre, which is all dementia. Um, yep. And I did have a few people, not just physios, but other people say, you know, why would a physio work there? <laughs> like mm. what, what would a physio have to do with dementia? Um, yeah, so you've described some really important um, kind of contributions, I suppose, of physio. You've also described some things that I think broadly in the community, we often think about dementia as a balance, um, not a balance, a memory issue. Yes. Um, and we don't see the other things. So Yeah, you don't, you, yeah, you're right. You don't, you don't see um, the anxiety unless you know the person, if they're going through what I call like a, uh, I just call on having a lousy time, but um, there's a lot of things that people don't see. And, and I think the, the worst start, I think most professions, but, but also in physiotherapy is 
if you know that your patient has dementia, you've got to start the conversation from, tell me about your dementia. How is it affecting your life? Don't, if he's got, if I've got a sore knee, for God's sake, don't talk about my sore knee, talk about my dementia. Because if you talk long enough with me and, I, and I'll ask you to ask me the question a few times, it helps to drill down into why I'm here with you, but you have to recognise it's my dementia that is the first thing I'm here for. I, I don't know whether that makes sense. Yeah, well, it's your experience and that's really important for, for mm. us to be aware of things like that. And yeah. interestingly, I've often thought um, that there's some aspects of treatment that are about dementia and then there's some aspects that are sort of nothing to do with it. It's dementia is the secondary because say you've got a sore knee, but you've actually, you've, you've taught me something there that, that when dementia is big in your life, yep. then it, it's across everything, regardless of whether it's a sore knee or a, you know. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and dementia is not this sort of linear function line I should do it from that side I guess mm -hmm. that goes down um it's it it's up and up and down I mean you've always got the dementia but how it affects you I can go two weeks and not be um you know in any strife getting lost or whatever but if I when I'm traveling and i work pretty hard for three or four days or whatever it might be, then it does take me four or five days to, to um, I guess, come down because when you're exhausted, it, that's when you get hit hard and you mm. just have to, to go through that. Um, but there you go. I can't remember the question again, Kate. <laughs> no, no, no. It's my, <laughs> it's my short term memory. That's the, the biggest issue for me. So sometimes people we might have a talk or i might meet you and then three minutes i'll be bypassing you and i go oh, i'll introduce myself so i'll introduce myself a second time to you mm. um but I, there's no way in the world i i remembered the first time yeah so sometimes i guess for a physio when you're talking to someone you might have to sometimes ask the same question two different ways just to make sure um, your uh, the answer that you're looking for is going to be the correct one I'm not sure that made sense but no that's fine and and so along those lines if a physio is maybe you know suggesting you should do some certain exercises like you described some balance exercises before did you do yeah. any of those when the physio wasn't with you or were they always with you um, no, I had to do practice exercises. Yeah. And um, f f it's different for everyone. For me, I can't follow the words to do an exercise. If, if you give me st stick drawings, it's easier. Yeah. But it's very, it's very different for people with dementia. I, I'm going through a section now where um, some, sometimes at the airport you'll, you'll see the toilets they don't have men or women sometimes written there. They just have a, the, oh, what do you call it, Kate? Like just a little picture of Logo the... thingy? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, excuse me, I can't tell the difference. So I have to wait until someone walks in the toilet so I know it's the men or the ladies. Now that corresponds back to do I need a diagram to try and follow that exercise that I practice or do I get it in words or can I, um, can the physiotherapist hold the camera phone while I do it so I can then look back on the video literally, you know, while I'm on the floor or whatever I'm doing yeah. to copy it. So videoing what the exercise is is probably the best one for me because again the text and getting the drawings wrong in my mind um, is an issue so use video if you're not that's really good 
Yeah. And on the video, would you also have the, like, how many times to do it and how long? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. I had a physio do that once when I went to the physio and I found that really helpful um, as well. But I suppose if someone didn't know much about your dementia and it's just listed down on a list of, you know, you've got blood pressure things, you've got whatever, uh, you've got dementia, um, people might not quite realise some of this detail um, and that might mean your your treatment isn't as effective as maybe it could be otherwise. Um, It's it's absolutely critical that you talk about my dementia, not make any uh, assumptions about generalised information on on dementia. Mm. Um, ask me now if I if I'm looking young, uh, you you're going to say, Phil, you know, you have young onset dementia. Can you tell me all about it? Because I'd really like to know how it might work in with your you know, your physiotherapy, um, now you're not working anymore or I noticed you have an assistance dog, you know, how does she help you? And I, I, I don't think you can conduct your physiotherapy consultation without first knowing all about my dementia. Now, it may be that you, I require an extended consult. Mm. In, in fact... If it's the first, you probably do an extended consult for uh, um, first uh, when you first come in. I'm not sure, but I think with someone with younger onset dementia, such as myself, you need a long conversation, and you need someone that's going to sit down with you and not and not have to go over and see someone else in the other cubicle and then come back and then go again. You've got to be right with me. Uh, And in a a private room, I don't want to... um, I've been in a practice where they just have the curtains Mm. and there's no way in the world I'm going to be giving you all my information in that setting. So um, you can do all you like with the right questioning. You're not going to get the right answers if you put me in a an uncomfortable situation like that because I think that's just it's to me it, it's unprofessional when it comes to dementia and asking me questions that's the only part I mean about that yeah yeah I guess it's really personal stuff isn't it I think mm. we often get worried about upsetting people or offending people if we were to dig and ask about things like I don't know what it is about dementia that we worry about sometimes but it sounds like you're super keen and and for others maybe they won't want to talk so much but you won't know unless you ask well that's exactly right yeah you won't know some people like me will just come out with it Mm -hmm. um and uh, some people will be very um uh, private about it and um uh, if they are, you might just want to still ask questions, of course, but you might just want to tone them uh, down a little bit, just perhaps a bit more generalised in terms of um, how is it affecting your, your day? Oh, you're still working. Or how is it affecting your day-to-day life? Or um, last time we saw you or whatever, uh, are you a keen gardener? Or um, don't go into playing bloody bowls or or um, <laughs> stuff like that. But you've got to, you've still got to ask the question. You might feel a bit more, a, a bit uncomfortable, but probably the, the person with dementia has been asked it so many times that I, I don't think it's going to be a massive, um, a massive problem, but we're all different. Yeah. But ask yeah. the questions regardless. Because yeah. you're going to get the wrong answers unless you get on top of the dementia part of it and there's no point going on yeah so so you've mentioned the importance of uh privacy um like having a you know a single room rather than a cubicle of someone being with you rather than ducking back and forth between other people Yep. you've mentioned the importance of things like exercises maybe on video or at least yep. asking what's the best way for you is there anything yep. else about physio that you can think of that that would be a good tip for us to be aware of um a follow-up phone call between appointments would be really good yeah um 
to to help me remember a few things um because you might say now how are you going with that particular exercise and i'm like jesus i totally forgot about that one or whatever it was so you can get me back online um so a follow-up like that um is really good yeah uh, because there's so many ways to get it wrong inside one week to the next yes and, and a follow-up phone call would only be five minutes yeah mm. yeah sure um all right someone i did throw out um onto our facebook group uh, APA one, um, if yeah. anyone had any questions. And someone asked about apathy. I'm not sure if that's something that you've experienced. It can be part of some types of dementia. Is that something you've come across struggling to sort of motivate yourself to do things? Yeah. Uh, I'm reasonably highly motivated. Mm. Um, uh, but sometimes it's Terribly hard to get. When I'm, it's like yesterday. I I slept most of the day because my body just tells me I need to, mm. um, and sometimes it's forced sleep in terms of medication. But I know that when I wake up, I'm usually uh, feeling better. Mm. Um, I can't remember the question again. Sorry, Kate. It was about sort of apathy and being able to get yourself going. Um, okay. Yeah. Sometimes. It does take a bit. Um, and for me, it was associated with my depression mm. and anxiety. And once um, uh, my specialist got that un under control, mm. uh, it made a big difference. It, it was easier to focus, easier to get out of bed. Yeah. Um, it was easier to shower. Having showers is a classic with people with dementia. You just forget it. Mm. Um, and not that I walk around without showers, guys, but sometimes you forget one or two. That's why we had to do this on Zoom, you know. We couldn't have been in the same room. <laughs> yeah, good on you, Kate. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, that's all I got for that one, I think, because I can't remember the question again. Yeah, yeah, about motivation and things. But actually, you raise a really important point is that I think we often make assumptions. It's often about older people, but I wouldn't be surprised if younger people with dementia might fit into this kind of thing as well, where we just sort of assume that, oh, well, if you've got dementia, you're going to be depressed anyway, or if you're going to, if you're getting old, it's normal. But actually, yeah. it's really important that if um, someone's having these kinds of things, going on that we seek attention from the right people um yeah. for you it's been your psychiatrist and it's made a really big difference yeah exactly um but the you know particularly i'm 63 now so i'm in i don't know what the age groups with uh th that need certain types of physiotherapy i guess it goes up with age you know similar things happen as our i guess as we wear out but physiotherapy is going to become uh, more and more important as the dementia um, increases over time. So um, if anything, you're probably more likely to see the person more as, they, as the progression um, increases. Yeah. And if you're not, there's probably a reason for it. It's probably a follow-up phone call with the patient, I think, would be a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So do you know many people with dementia that would be having physio? Because I still feel like it's not very well known. We did a position statement, as you know, the APA yeah, yeah. and Dementia Australia. We put together some kind of what can physio do and why is it valuable for people with dementia, purely because often people have no idea. Um, hmm. But do you know others? You clearly you clearly have seen physios, value physio, it helps you, has helped yeah, oh, you. Yeah, and I've got dementia mates that find the same thing yeah um, but i think you might find it comes up via younger onset and the ndis um excuse me <clears throat> um with my ndis planner uh, they suggest that i see an occupational therapist um a physiotherapist um and Someone else, I, I, I can't remember off the top, 
So that was organised very quickly for me because once they sat down and assessed that um, I was having some problems in this area, um, the occupational therapy got um, a stair railings put in going down to our garage. Um, they're now organising a, a sticky surface on our timber floors um, because I've slipped once before. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and when I did slip, that was one of my first interactions with the physiotherapist as well. Mm. Um, so I think you'll see it more coming from younger people than necessarily older people. Mm. That's what I think anyway. Yeah, it's a really interesting thought. And that, that gets me in a whole rant in terms of NDIS versus aged care, because I think we yeah. still have similar, just because you tick over 66, you know, it doesn't mean you don't have similar issues and needs. No, no, it, um, it, exactly. And movement with dementia is, is really a, a, a difficult area. And, and it's undertreated. There's no doubt about that. Physio is not predominant enough in dementia. I think the profession has got a long way to go mm. um, with that with that area. I'm sure there's many of your colleagues that are proactive with it, but um, I think what the association has done recently um, with that promotion is terrific. Um, but um, you know, even if Joe Blow comes in and you might say, do you have any, um, you know, you go through your questions, do you have any dementia in the family? Um, oh, your father has it. So suddenly um, you might want to drill down a bit further, may not have it, but they're at risk of having it. And that's, I guess, important for your notes because if they come back in two years or four years' time, they may then have younger onset dementia. So I think it's important to be able to have those those things in the notes for you to be aware that what you should be bringing up in a conversation, um, even if it was my father, you know, is it's quite possibly that it, it could come down the line. Yeah, it's really interesting that you say that. And some of the work that we're doing here at the Wicking Centre is around looking at early movement changes that might uh, indicate, you know, future risk of dementia. Um, yep. and a potential role for physios in that regard as well, even without knowing yep. family history, maybe at some point there'll be particular things we could be looking out for that might yeah. then encourage a referral back to the GP or, you know, yeah. an encouragement to explore things further. Um, but for you, a diagnosis, was that a good thing? Some people argue that, oh, you don't want to get a diagnosis because all that's going to happen is they'll say, get your affairs in order and nothing will happen. But is it good um, to have a diagnosis? Is it, yeah, it not is. good? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it is. It'd be good if people believed you, though. Um, one of the big feedbacks I get from, from people I deal with dementia is that people don't believe them. Um, GPs won't believe them. Um, it, it'll take three assessments with a neurologist before someone sits you down and says, no, you do have dementia. Um, it's a really bit, it, it's a bit weird. And I've lost my train of thought again, Kate. I'm sorry. No, no, that's right. I'm too busy listening and I'm forgetting too. <laughs> <laughs> you've, just, yeah. you've just got to keep me on track, that's all. Yeah, yeah. No, but having a diagnosis is a, is a, a positive thing. I yeah, guess oh, yeah, without yeah. it, you couldn't have the NDIS support, could you? Because No, and, and yeah. I think you'd wonder what the heck was going on. And I think you'd start to hide it. Um, mm. I'm a big risk taker. I love taking risks. And um, if someone says, I can't do this or you can't possibly do that, uh, then I'll do it. Um, because if you don't take a risk, you don't have independence. And if you don't have mobility, then you don't have independence. Yeah. So it seems, what's the word I was going to say? This is where I, 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 I've lost my finding words with my de my dementia um but they the the movement the diagnosis of dementia and taking risks is is all together um and those three things really are the the top things that you have to think about and because of movement 
uh, physiotherapists can't ignore that. Mm. Mm. So you were saying that we've got a bit of a way to go as a profession. Um, what sort of things do you think we could be doing to make things better? Um, understanding dementia, jumping on the Dementia Australia website. There's a, a section there for, for professionals to go through. Um, read it. Um, occasionally review it. I mean, as professionals, you must get so much stuff come across your desk um but i want you to put dementia right at the top now um rather than um oh i saw a patient with dementia the other day well perhaps i if i'm seeing a few people with dementia perhaps i should be changing the way my practice interacts first from word from word go um because you're going to see more and more people with dementia as as time goes on. Mm. So um, put it towards the top of the priority list when you're speaking with people. And just yeah. because they look young um, and you're noticing that they're forgetting things uh, doesn't mean they, they don't have dementia. Yeah. And you mentioned about how someone's practice is. And I guess there's also environmental things to consider, right, in terms of carpets or stairs or things because visual perception can be impacted yep. um have, has environment ever made a difference to you um there's some hallways in nursing homes that i've visited uh, with my dad where the carpet's just insane like it's <laughs> it's like a uh i don't know um it's just so much happening on on the carpet it it, it feels like Bits of the carpet are higher, and, and some are lower. It needs to be. It needs to be consistent. Um, and um, uh, stairs. If you have to go upstairs, the, the edges of them really need to be identified. You know, really well. Um, mm. You know, just those things that just aren't for people with straight mobility. The same ideas work for people with dementia when their perception of what they're seeing is not exactly the same as what you're seeing. Yeah, yeah. So if people are interested, there are environmental assessment tools available that yep. give recommendations around um, what yep. you can do, particularly if you're setting up a new um, practice space. Yeah, and again, that's on the Dementia Australia website on the professional mm. section, yeah. Beautiful. Well, do you know what, Phil, I, I would, um, probably talk to you all day but at some point we do need to to wind up so before we finish are there just any any key messages I suppose that you'd like to leave with the physios watching this today um at your next national conference have me there um I'll uh, I promise you I'll teach you a lot um ser seriously have someone living with dementia at your next national conference. Um, you know, I reckon it'd be really silly not to. That's, that's probably the biggest advice that I can, that I can give you. Kate's got my number. But, <laughs> I do. But you, but you need to, the, all your colleagues, Kate, need to have an understanding of, of dementia. In your case, as a as a professional, you you don't want to just hear the um, the medical parts of the, of dementia because you're not dealing with that. You're dealing with the actual person, so you need to know the ins and outs of someone living with dementia, not someone just telling you the graphs and all the other stuff associated with it. So yeah. without saying to you, I reckon that's my biggest message. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think, look, I've mostly worked in hospitals and I've been to lots of in-services on dementia and they often are, you know, this is dementia, these are the causes, Alzheimer's is the most, then this, then this, then this, yeah. you know, and you get lots of information, but yeah. you do leave at the end going, so yeah, exactly. now what do we do? <laughs> um, yeah. And an important part of that is actually meeting people, talking with people. Um, like exactly. yourself yeah. yeah 
Fantastic. Well, thank you. We're going to close up now. Thank you to everyone who's been watching. I hope you've taken away some interesting uh, food for thought from this um, presentation. And thank you, um, Phil, for your openness and your honesty in sharing with us. Um, I think, I think, I hope we can all agree that physio is everybody's business. Uh, it's not just for the aged care physios, it's for all of us. Um, yeah, so thanks, Phil, and uh, thanks Pleasure. everybody else. See ya.